Hi, my name is Natasha Stavros, and I am the director of CU Boulder Earth Lab Analytics Hub. And I'm going to be talking about the wicked wildfire problem and the solution space. I'd like to acknowledge contributions from Joaquin Ramirez, founder of TechnoSilva, and Jennifer Balch, director of CU Boulder Earth Lab. So what is the problem? Well, megafires, not fires. We have always had fire. And the reality is that we need fire. If you look back at the last 3,000 years, you can see we've had variable fire through time. But specific to the last 200 years, we have had a deficit. And that deficit, deficit in part contributes to the problem of megafires. It is worth noting that over the last 200 years, megafires are not new. In fact, they've been regularly spaced since 1825. And this is a list of the 30 worst burns um, since 1825. And worst burns are considered by you know, area burned, lives lost, and structures lost. While this particular graph ends at 2014, we do know that megafires are becoming more common. So if, if we extend that list to present, you can see here that 2000 through 2019 makes up a huge portion of our megafires and on to 2020. So what is a megafire? Well, it's a socio-political term, not a quantifiable one, for the fires that matter. Big fires matter for smoke. What you see here is the 2020 fire season um, in California and the Western United States. Um, with aerosols and smoke stretching across the continent over to the East Coast, the Atlantic, and eventually over to Europe. Proximity matters for infrastructure. So what you see here in this graph are circles or dots, and these dots represent the number of homes that are in the line of fire and are threatened. Or it, it could be in the line of fire and are potentially threatened by fire. Fast fires matter for lives. So let's look at the 2018 California campfire, which traveled about 1880 football fields per minute. It takes about 15 minutes for the average wildland fire to be reported in the United States, and another 45 minutes for fire management resources to be deployed to remote, hard to access locations. The best resources in the world for suppression average production line rates of about 3,200 feet per hour or about a kilometer per hour. And a production line is what's used to contain a fire perimeter. So that means that our management options are not suppression, but rather where do we evacuate? What assets need protecting? And what do we do to protect them? We do know that we do know what creates fires and specifically large fire events. Um, there's always three ingredients, no matter which scale you're looking at. But for today's talk, we're going to focus on climate, vegetation, or fuels, and ignitions. Specific to climate, we know that warm, dry, and windy increases our fire danger. What you see here on the right is a map of fire danger indices calculated from temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, and wind to determine the fire danger. And the colored parts represent a departure from normal or an increase in fire danger out into the future. With this data, we were able to predict that climate alone will increase the likelihood of very large fire events by two to three times or three to 400%. We know that fuel is important and there are three characteristics of fuel that we need to consider. The first is availability. Fuel accumulation affects fire behavior, especially in steep terrain. So what you see here on the right is the 2014 California King Fire. It simulated through two timestamps. The blue represents the current fuel loading and the pink represents half the fuel loading. And you can see that with half the fuel loading, the fire did simply did not travel as fast. Fuel condition. Drought stress and tree mortality affect how flammable fuels are. So if you look at this figure, you can see the Woolsey Fire in the Santa Monica Mountains of California. What you see on the top is mortality from 2013, 14, 15, and 16. And if you look at that mortality and compare it to the burn scar, you can see that areas with mortality are the areas that burned. We know that fuel type is important, and often we talk about type in the context of plants. 
And specifically, we talk about it in the context of native versus invasive. And we do that because invasive grasses are little arsonists. Um, this is a picture on the left of sheet grass, which is highly flammable. And um, what you see on the right is after a fire, which completely desolated the landscape. Now, while native plants do have reserves and are adapted for fire and can come back after fire, the problem comes when invasives that are highly flammable burn more frequently than the native plants are adapted. And this can deplete resources for those plants and make it uh, more susceptible to type conversion or a change in ecosystem. The second type of fuels that we need to talk about are homes. We have a growing wildland urban interface with new fuels and little understanding of how they burn at landscape scales. Right now, insurance companies will build houses inside warehouses and burn them to see how they burn. What effects does that have when you account for the stochastic nature of how fire spreads across the landscape? The third ingredient is ignitions. We know that people start many of the fires that matter. You've seen this graphic earlier in this presentation where you were looking at the size of the circle for the number of homes threatened. But what you need to look at now is the color of those circles. Red denotes greater than 90% of the fires that are threatening homes started by humans. Furthermore, humans are extending the fire season when lightning fires occur during a distinct season, whereas human fires occur over the entire year. And that peak in around day 165, that's the 4th of July. So when you put all those ingredients together, the fires that matter are the ones with high fire risk. Fire risk is a very specific term, and it's used to talk about the convergence of exposure, vulnerability, and fire hazard, which we can determine from variables like number of people, the demographics, human-related ignitions, climate and weather, vegetation, lightning, the number and location of buildings and roads, building materials and type, as well as infrastructure such as power lines that start many of the fires we see today. Knowing this and combining different data streams, a million acre fire like we saw in 2020 in California is well within our predictive ability. You can see here on the left, the million acre fire, the August complex, um, very few fires ever reached that, but our statistics were robust in showing that in fact, it was possible. And if you look on the right, you can see that at some times we can get as high as a 15% probability when you can account for all three of those different ingredients. So we understand the problem. Let's talk about the solution. But before we do, there are a number of myths that I'd like to first highlight. The first myth is that the fire community needs technologists and scientists to redesign their methods. The second is that technology alone will solve the problem. The third is that a single company or organization will solve the problem. The fourth is that detection is our problem. And the last is that suppression is the answer. If we want to talk about a solution, we have to look at our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats. This is intentionally small on the screen because I don't want you to read it now, but I do want to highlight that contributor Joaquin Ramirez recently published in March 2021 in the International Association of Wildland Fire a detailed SWOT analysis. I will, however, pull out some of the key points specific to fire detection and tracking of the fires that matter. Some strengths that we have are that wildland fire agencies have meaningfully evolved based on lessons learned from past fire incidents and are very advanced on many fronts, organization, resources, tactics, safety, and technology. Applied research and technology implementation are world-class with CAL FIRE, and they are actively improving real-time decision-making. The understanding of the wildfire problem is probably better documented than anywhere in the world. Data, science-based analysis, and world-class technologies support decision-making today. With that in mind, I'd like to show you a demonstration of what the technologies actually look like. So what you can see here is zooming in on an ESRI environment, looking at it in 3D. 
We can see CAD incidents reports and resources overlaid on the landscape, as well as, well as weather predictions and observations, wildfire cameras integrated into one tool. Near real-time hotspots from GOES, VIRS, and MODIS, as well as information on fire trajectories and progression from classified assets. Airborne and drone data overlaid. and simulations and real-time simulations of where the fire is expected to go. So with that in mind, where are our weaknesses? More work is needed to understand fire progression within structures and work that needs to be done to have better fire-hardened houses and communities. Sometimes there are different strategies in firefighting in federal and state lands. We have reduced number of available hand crews by a combination of regulations, shorter sentences, budget cuts, and COVID. This is particularly important because right now many of our hand crews are in, inmates that are not being paid a fair wage. And so this is another area of environmental injustice that is occurring and converges with the social injustice that we're seeing across the country today. Some opportunities are that climate change initiatives are in the first line of the political agenda and the fire situation is closely associated with it. Research and technology implementation is moving full speed to support wildfire risk reduction and community needs. Increased collaboration from vested stakeholders such as electric utility and insurance and reinsurance agencies is driving forward science and operations. Remote sensing is giving us new, novel ways to predict risk and monitor ongoing incidents. Lastly, our threat. The, the pace of climate change is putting cold and temperate forests in extreme conditions for what used to be normal years. And the growing wildfire litigation industry is focused on ignitions and detection and not on propagation, which is characteristic of the California firescape. Lastly, we have a lack of cellular networks throughout much of the wilderness areas, which reduces efficiencies and creates an inability to use the technologies that do exist. So what does a solution look like to the wicked wildfire problem? A solution will include policy, specifically resolving conflicting policies related to the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, and suppression versus prescribed burning. It will enable sovereign stewardship through cultural fire, it will expand health and safety policy to include building codes and zoning, and it will incorporate climate policy as green decentralized energy that does not require transporting energy vast distances. From an economic perspective, it will include removing barriers to siloed funding and cross agency collaboration. Right now, our land management agencies do not have the resources to put satellites in space and our space agencies do not have the mandate to directly meet fire management needs and requirements. What we really need is an organizing body with a single mission that works across agencies. We also need to differentiate funds for proactive versus reactive measures. Right now in the United States, both are paid out of the same pot, which means as reactive measures increase, we have less funds for research and mitigation. We need to disincentivize building in high-risk areas, and we need to incentivize equitable home hardening. From the sociocultural perspective, we need to cultivate a user community by embedding training for using the technologies we do have in incident command position trainings. We need to raise public awareness through campaigns like Smokey the Bear or No Drones. If you fly, someone could die. Right now, we have a lot of people with their own private drones interested in it, looking at where the fire is. But if they fly, we have to ground all of our troops. We need to redefine fire risk to include feedbacks between humans and the natural system. Right now, we treat fire as an extrinsic phenomenon to ourselves, when in fact, we have intricate feedbacks and interactions with fire in that natural system. We need to collaborate to integrate traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous people instead of pushing colonial science measures. 
um, and methods. Lastly, from a technological perspective, we need to coordinate data collection from drone, aircraft, and satellite. In order to do this, we need to have data standards and compliance certifications. We have a lot of independent drone operators all creating their own data, but the data management problem is nearly impossible to overcome. By having data standards, we can create a data clearinghouse and open data access to enable hundreds of innovators to advance the state of the science and the tools that we have available to us. We need to provide sustainable, operational, viable product with information of value on the fires that matter in the decision-making context. And we need to enable accessibility, both for fire management personnel with limited connectivity and to the public. I want to highlight that a solution will include active fire management and pre and post resilience planning. But the scope for this workshop is detecting and tracking the fires that matter. And the reason for that is because we have a limited amount of time. There's always opportunities for follow on workshops. The vision is to unlock the potential of hundreds of innovators by converging on a clearly defined problem and solution. Specifically, our objectives for this workshop are to refine the solution and define high level driving objectives for an observing system and associated information system to detect and track the fires that matter. And I want to emphasize the fires that matter is very complex and it is not simply detecting from space but includes all of the associated information for context of that fire next to people and resilient communities. We need to outline a coordinated plan to broadly provide the necessary information of fire detection and tracking. And our third and final objective is to develop a community that can work together to solve the wicked wildfire problem. When you look at this solution space, no one agency or organization can do everything. That means that we need to work together to solve the problem. I encourage you to ask yourself, what is it that I can do with my mission and my organization? And how can I work with others in this room and beyond to help move towards this goal?